A very warm welcome to everybody who joined us today. Um, uh, my name is Christine Ranzi, and uh, I'm going to be your host for today. This is a Knowledge Equity Network uh, session, and our title today is Open Education, Creating Accountable Spaces for Equitable Participation. Uh, I'm one of the senior leads for the uh, Knowledge Equity Network, and uh, we have two wonderful guests today to discuss this topic. So just a few words about the Knowledge Equity Network, first of all. This is an ambitious uh, initiative that has been um, set up by the University of Leeds, uh, the University of Pretoria and many other institutions around the world to foster open uh, boundary crossing and uh, collaboration across the sector uh, to bring together universities, organizations and activists to uh, share knowledge, to produce knowledge and reduce inequalities to solve some of the big problems we have uh, in our time. So it's very much uh, an action network. Um, and one of the sessions we are doing is here today, where we bring uh, together individuals from different parts of the world to celebrate um, the activities that we are undertaking and create alliances uh, among uh, institutions and individuals and organizations. At the moment, we have 22 universities, 35 organizations in 59 countries and 260 individuals um, and activists involved in the Knowledge Equity Network. So today we have two wonderful guest speakers. We have George uh, Sfungaras, Yorgos Fungaras, and Dr. Gabi Witthaus um, with us. I'm going to introduce them both. Uh, I met Gabi through the Global OER Graduate Network, uh, which is led by the Open University in the UK, uh, when we were both doctoral students. And uh, I met George, uh, or Yorgos, um, through his wonderful work that he did for the uh, open book Higher Education for Good, which is an edited uh, collection uh, led by Professor Laura Jernovic and Dr. Catherine Cronin. It's really definitely worth uh, looking at this and exploring the, the richness of work, but I particularly connected with um, George's work there. So just a few words about George and I'll hand over to him. George Sfugaras is an artist uh, and educator. He has been in, in various positions um, in, in different parts of the world. He is based in the UK and exhibits uh, nationally and internationally, has won multiple awards and artist uh, residencies. His work is really about um, how our lives are affected by history, uh, national symbols and myths. And that is really illustrated well on that cover, which I think he will refer to as well. So I'm not going to take the magic away. Um, but he, yes, so... I'm just going to read something from uh, his recent blog post and I'm going to hand over to George. So George, uh, in his own words, says the following about creative partnerships. There is a need to choose people to work with who can't see you, acknowledge you, value you, whom you trust, and okay, let's say it plainly, who accept and acknowledge your pain. These are powerful words, and I'm going to hand over to George. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chrissy, um, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to use a presentation because uh, it contains some of the elements that I want to talk about today. And if we don't get through it, then it will be available uh, after this session. So. Um, First of all, uh, my voice is one of reconciliation. So I will talk about some very difficult issues, but I'm not here to moralize or make political statements. I'm simply here to state that I will work with um, all sides to create equitable spaces um, and to achieve equality and parity. So um, this particular video, which actually uh, somehow I wanted it in the middle of the presentation to prepare you for uh, this the, the process was filmed in Jerusalem in 2020 and it um, was a project I was invited to film involving Muslim and Jewish Israeli women 
uh, who were selected to take part in a theater production uh, titled uh, Grandmother Stories. All the women were um, in their 60s or late middle age um, and all came and had memories of Jerusalem uh, before and after the the 67 war. So um, these women came together to work and this is a tiny glimpse of their working together. So um, just a little introduction and I'll try and be brief. I'm an artist, I've been a head teacher. Um, my parents were war refugees and that history really, uh, when I came to analyze it in adulthood, uh, started to form the cornerstone of my work. Um, I was asked to present here because I had a conversation with Chrissy about um, really um, family and belonging. And she was very kind to share the article by Elise Ahankora about accountable spaces. Uh, it made me rethink and reframe some of my ideas and some of the difficult issues I've experienced in the past. So that little chance discussion became something much bigger. Uh, and it made me realize, really, that for me, art is very fragile. And that, as Chris has said at the in the introduction, cooperation to be successful, it must really be based on the firm belief that we're all unique, yet equal. I mentioned the next bit about being a voice of reconciliation, and I hope you'll join me in that. Um, but um, I want to talk about um, the article uh, Ahankora's article, and particularly um, her statement that safe and brave spaces don't work and what you can do instead. Um, I want to talk about um, really three instances, but I want to talk first of all about safe spaces. Now, this particular image has been used widely by various organizations and I think the reason it resonates is because it creates this feeling of safety, yet uh, danger. And um, in, a, in a safe space, as we understand it, um, we cannot really guarantee the protection of marginalized or uh, underrepresented groups, because those safe spaces exist within very difficult contexts. They've not been structured in the right way. They're, they're a wonderful concept, but they are problematic. So I think the image of the boat in precarious waters and the tree, which can only really last in that space for a very short time until it finds a safe shore, is kind of resonant and um, I think portrays that feeling for me. Um, Akankora talks about brave spaces as being very difficult for underrepresented groups who are automatically seen as the people that have to do all the educating, if you like. They have to uh, display courage. They have to uh, again and again explain their position, reinforce particular issues. Uh, and she calls that unfair and exhausting. And I have to say, having been in senior management in the education system in the UK at a time when it was perhaps unusual for a, a first uh, generation immigrant to be in that position, I did feel that and it's interesting actually to reflect back about how much work one has to do on a daily basis um i'm not resenting it i'm just simply stating that it can be very exhausting and i think this image from uh, malka al haddad's book um really depicts that for me this struggle to actually take off but the weight is um, immeasurable and finally she talks about accountable spaces and how Accountable spaces require everyone to agree, to move in the same direction, to support diversity, equality, and inclusion, and to allow for mistakes and feedback. Uh, and this is really the, the most important thing. The commitment to change and improve makes these spaces particularly significant. Um, I want to briefly touch on three contexts, and perhaps it's a little ambitious, but I wanted to take this idea of accountable spaces and apply it to situations where I had some unresolved issues, there had been some uh, problems in delivery, or I had encountered some difficulties, or there were other things that I wanted to reframe. And I've applied them to a special needs setting, an art project with refugees and asylum seekers in the UK, 
and a theater project in Jerusalem with Arab and um, Jewish Israeli women. Um, you will be familiar with uh, Brofenbrenner's model. Uh, I have made a very simple version of it here because I wanted to simplify things for myself, but also to be able to apply it to three diverse yet related difficult uh, environments or rather challenging environments uh, in the time that we have available today. So I have power structures, social context, and the accountable space that we try to create within each of those projects. Uh, interestingly, and it occurred to me while I was doing this, that in, in democratic environments, the divisions between these areas are quite flexible and fluid. In autocratic environments, the lines are harder, much more difficult to have a, you know, a sort of connection, a flow of information between social and power structures. Um, and I'm going to um, talk about each of the situations that I mentioned uh, using this, um, this paradigm. In the hospital school, we had a situation where we were trying to create a space for young people and to imbue their daily experience with hope and create transferable successes. These are young people that are facing enormous life challenges, both emotionally, um, sometimes psychologically, and very often physically. The system that surrounded that accountable space that we tried to create was quite robust. The context um, is that special needs are seen as an essential requirement in the UK. Um, they, they're also seen as a disadvantage. So if we have a special needs child, they're not immediately celebrated for their inequalities. They are very often seen as um, an issue that needs to be addressed. And this is something that I won't discuss right now, but it's a very big topic. However, the legal structures like the Disability Discrimination Act, the Hospital Education uh, Act, and the Special Needs and Disability Act all provide a very robust legal structure, which is reinforced by the general feeling in society that we need to do our best for the least, for the most challenged, the most uh, in need of support. So that was the context of the hospital school. Uh, and it's a very challenging environment, but I will park that now and take this same model and apply it to a different situation. One thing I want to mention is that a young person coming in from the outside has to navigate this particular social context with all the disadvantages and advantages it affords. And also when they go out, they take something of this accountable space with them. And if we're lucky and the professionals working within this system who are well qualified, work within a, a supervisory structure that's very robust, safeguarding systems and so forth, they can also influence through lobbying the legal structure and framework that surrounds the context in which that particular accountable space operates. So this is a very robust system, creating a sustainable and possibly very, very powerful um, accountable space. Is everybody still there and still okay for me to continue? Everything is going well. We are listening with interest. Thank okay, thank you. So um, this particular art project, I will mention briefly, although it deserves a lot longer really, was to bring together a group of refugees and asylum seekers who were in a state, we were in a state, they were in a state of limbo. They were experiencing, um, you know, this daily waiting and um, lack of opportunity to engage with society. Um, um, and we brought this group together to work with me to create an exhibition that was part of a much bigger um, engagement with the National Portrait Gallery and so on. However, um, we have a legal structure that supports um, refugees and asylum seekers. We've got the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and so forth, Human Rights Act. However, the environment in which uh, refugees and asylum seekers operate is actually quite hostile. Uh, we see this daily in the news, uh, and we also know that uh, there are major issues with um, getting 
certain sections of the population to accept um, you know, refugees and uh, their resettlement in this country. This is not unique to the UK, sadly, but we're talking about the context right here. Um, navigating this context, the refugees had to come through this uh, external context, the society, community in which they live, uh, on the bus, uh, managing a system that perhaps they were not familiar with at the time, and some of them took out with them some very positive messages and were able to relate to other people within the group with some success. However, I'm going to park that there. This particular system was not very robust because the accountability was lacking. Um, as soon as the project was finished, people went back to their homes, their their spaces, their own spaces, and really that was the end of that particular project. Finally, the project in Jerusalem. Now, I, I'm not, as I say, going to moralize or um, speak politics today. Um, I have very strong views, as we all have, and we want peace as soon as possible, but uh, I want to talk about the situation in 2020. This was the week after Trump had announced the um, legalization of the West Bank settlements, so it was a very restless period. Yet, this group, which uh, happened because of the tenacity of two Swiss um, Israeli women that live permanently in Israel, Adina Tal and Mikhail Elbaz, um, was very successful uh, as far as um, its remit went. Uh, it was to create a space for women, um, to share their memories, to show their similarities. And the interesting thing about it was that the families had come to Israel from, in not in this generation, but in previous generations, from uh, Jewish communities in Kurdistan, Bukhara, Morocco, Poland, Germany, and so forth. The Muslim women come from Abu Ghosh, which is a, a small um, settlement in the periphery of uh, Jerusalem, a beautiful, um, I suppose you'd call it a village or a small town. Um, and so we work together to create a narrative uh, based on their lives and to present this with a film of them in relaxed moments projected in the background. The odds are stacked against the Arab minority, as we know, they constitute 20% um, of the Israeli population, um, yet um, they are hugely disadvantaged. 10 of the poorest towns in uh, Palestine, Israel are um, Arab and the richest 30 are Jewish. So there is a disparity in many, many ways. Um, the hospital, I'll just very quickly summarize here now, because we have three very disparate um, projects and why bring them together. I said I wanted to bring them together to look at the accountability structures that enable things to happen in a positive and constructive way. The hospital school was highly successful because there is everything in play and in place for it to happen. The the robust legal structure, the robust supervision structure, all the things that I mentioned, the funding and so forth. Uh, and of course, there could be more funding, but again, this is a separate issue. Having said all that, the most significant element in anything, uh, really, particularly in schools, is the relationship between staff and pupils. And there, the selection of staff and the efficacy of the organization depend on those relationships. So the relationships, again, despite the fact that everything around was created to support the work of the staff and the students, the legal, the supervision, the uh, support, the training, what really mattered at the end was the personal relationships. The informal arrangements in the refugee projects, um, in the refugee project that I uh, helped to support, um, were problematic because working with refugees in armed environments really needs to be very, very clear. Uh, particularly where elements of the project are subcontracted uh, and people come into the project without 
formal knowledge, without training, without an awareness of the trauma, the disadvantage, the loss of everything that has occurred before the participants actually enter the room. So there is a huge amount of information that you cannot quiz, you cannot ask people about it because it will trigger, but yet to, you have to be aware and tread very carefully. And this is not always possible unless proper preparation arrangements and agreements uh, are structured before the project. The Jerusalem project was highly challenging because of the environment in which it took place. Um, it was highly significant. Uh, many of the women had experienced several wars and loss, conflict. The presentation of the play to a mixed audience was also hugely significant. What really enabled this to work was that the stakes were so high. Um, the women knew that this was a, a very significant event. They're of a generation that doesn't ordinarily work in this way together. Most of the women were also widows. Uh, there were there were a lot of dynamics in the project that really were quite um, quite difficult. Yet they were overcome through the tenacity and the willingness of the people within it to work together. Um, even though the, a lot of the agreements were tacit, the women knew through being socialized in that environment that they needed to tread very carefully with each other. There was an enormous amount of sensitivity, care and friendship amongst the group. So I'm very proud to have been a small part of that. It was really a triumph of goodwill and hope at a time when um, before the current situation. And I, I am sure it will happen again. So just to summarize, for accountable spaces to work, yes, we do need empathy and respect and commitment to equality, but really all these things must be encoded in ways that hold the individuals accountable. How that's done is in, entirely up to the group, of course, uh, but in large organizations, the structures are already in place. One thing I will say uh, before I dismiss that as it's up to the organizers. I have to say that in informal settings, this is much harder because often coordinators in art environments don't really want to appear heavy handed. Uh, they don't want to offend. They don't want to appear too officious. They believe that art flows by itself and everything will be absolutely fine. Yet really this initial stage when working with vulnerable groups is essential in order to create a robust project and a robust outcome. So the first step when a group or a project is being set up is to be clear about the aims and the interactions. This is essential in order to define the nature of the group and the relationships and create a space of reflective accountability. Um, I will pause there because I'm not sure of the time. I can go on a little bit longer, but here, from here on in the presentation, which you will get after the, the meeting, you will find the resources I, I've collected and further links to things that I hope will be of use. Um, there are projects about um, Palestinians and Israelis working together and also some reference to projects from Serbia, Croatia, and Bosnia, Herzegovina. Um, also similarly projects from Colombia. Um, examples of transforming early years uh, through creating accountable spaces. And finally, a checklist and a wonderful list that was used by uh, Kalyan Balavan um, in the Inclusion Factor Network, which is an education consultancy that has compared safe, brave and accountable space guidelines to show the difference and how accountable spaces are actually the way forward. And also some other global projects, which you can refer to. And finally, I will leave this particular slide, but go directly to this image I picked up in Jerusalem. Uh, as I was leaving. Um, it's from 1936, and it's an Arab fortune teller um, telling a young Jewish man his fortune. And the whole atmosphere, the setting, it was so hopeful. Um, I felt that I had to 
to bring it with me and bring it here today to this presentation as an end note of what I hope will be a hopeful and productive future for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Yorgos or, or George. This was very moving and very powerful, the, the stories and experiences you shared uh, and the project. So, so important for all of us, what you say there about accountability and how that maybe is sort of um, captured in organizations formally, but maybe not in a lived experience. So I would be very interested to hear uh, after Gabi uh, presents also your perspective on how art could potentially help us create these accountable spaces because we often document uh, our thinking, our processes uh, using written language. I was wondering the role art can play to actually bring us closer together and make us more accountable through creative inquiry potentially. But that's something to, to look at after we have Gabi. And I do need to apologize to everybody because I struggled originally to find participants. I have, I can see who you are now. I can see you all. And I can also see the chat, which feels but so much better. Uh, and we will be chatting a little bit more uh, there now, because many of you do know me, uh, but I, I couldn't see where you are and where the chat is. So all fine now. So please keep your questions coming, keep engaging. And um, we will continue with Gabi. I'm just going to do a brief introduction to Gabi, uh, and then we'll hand uh, over to her. So we are delighted to have Dr. Gabi Witthaus with us. As I said, I know her from GoGM, uh, and we have a shared journey on our uh, doctoral research. Uh, Gabi is today a research fellow at UCL, where she works on a very important project linked to Lebanon and, and Thailand and refugee camps there and developing educational capacity. So very um, similar, but also different uh, to what George just communicated with us. She has a very varied career. I was, um, it was very interesting to find out more about you, Gabi. Um, in South Africa, working as an adult literacy tutor uh, many years ago, uh, if I'm, if that's okay to say, language teacher, then teaching English as well, and uh, curriculum development also, but started working in higher education in 2009 and has been through a number of universities. So she has experienced the higher education system uh, in different institutions, small and big, old and new. So this is very useful experience, I think, and then shows um, um, the experience she has, but also what she has learned and what she brings to this. I'm just going to say a few words again from uh, one of her blog posts, which I found interesting, which I think will relate to what she's going to present us. And Gabi talks there, um, on her blog post, Art of Learning, that's the website she has, about students' engagement in online learning is highly influenced by their emotional well-being and their sense of social belonging. These are difficult aspects for teachers, learning designers to take into account when developing or revising their modules, but there's evidence that if we don't do so, some students are more likely to drop out. I'll hand over to you. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Gabby. Thank, thank you so much, Chrissy, for that uh, very lovely introduction. Um, and thank you to everybody who's come to this session today. I see lots of names of friends in the participants list. Um, so I'm going to screen share now. Let's see. Um, and hopefully now you are seeing my presentation. So after George's rather expansive view of accountable spaces across widely differing contexts, I'm going to narrow it down now to a context that um, many people in the audience, I expect, are very familiar with, and that is online higher education. Um, and it's based largely on my research for my PhD, which I finished last year, and um, that was on online engagement and the barriers and enablers to online engagement, particularly for refugees and asylum seekers who were learning in fully distance programs. 
So there's a lot of literature that goes back many years on student engagement, a much smaller body of literature on specifically on online student engagement. But what all the literature has in common is at least these four dimensions, that student engagement in their learning happens it, through emotional engagement, behavioral, social and collaborative and cognitive engagement. And there's often a tendency um, on the part of teachers to really emphasize the cognitive and the behavioral, which is where students submit assignments and so on, because those are where we really have evidence that they're learning. Um, but my research showed, as Chrissy just explained, um, that the emotional and social and collaborative, um, at least for my group of uh, research participants were very important. So let me ask you, in your experience of either learning or teaching online, how important is social engagement? So this is a Mentimeter um, poll and you go into menti.com, you use the code 1962, 9952, or you just click on the link in the chat. And um, I'll give you a few moments to decide. Okay, I think not everyone has voted, but, um, oh, okay, we're getting some new responses coming in. I'll leave it another couple of moments. Um, so the picture that's emerging is from this group. Most people are saying it's either very important or moderately important. No one has said it's not important. Um, and there might be some who don't really know. Um, so I will move on from this slide now. And what I'm going to do is take you through three, uh, very briefly, three models of learning design that many of you are probably very familiar with that um, give the, the evidence for why um, social engagement is important for most learners, not for every single learner, um, but for most learners in online programs. So some of you might be familiar with the Communities of Inquiry model, which has been around since 2001, Garrison et al. And what they did was they showed, I think that what was groundbreaking in this model was that they showed that social presence is of equal value to students as cognitive presence and uh, teaching presence. Um, and this was a time when e-learning was just starting to take off and lots of corporate training programs were kind of coming out on CD-ROMs and, you know, it was supposed to be individually self-paced learning. But the communities of inquiry model really um, showed evidence that people needed social engagement. Similarly, Jilly Salmon's five-stage model, I expect many people here are familiar with it, have used it, and basically... Um, this was also from around 2009, 2010, um, based on evidence that students learning online went through this fairly linear sequence of needing to first get access and motivation to get started on learning online, especially as it was still very new to most people then. And then there was a period of what Jilly called online socialization, which is just getting to know others in the group, your peers, feeling a sense of belonging, and then a sharing of information, and then social knowledge construction, and then people going off on their independent journeys of um, development. Um, and finally, Dinah Lorillard's conversational framework model, um, which was already in embryonic form in the late 90s, I'd say, and became um, and came out in her books um, in the early 2000s. Um, 
And she identified these six learning types, which many of you are probably familiar with from the ABC model of learning design. Um, and every single one of these six learning types, even a acquisition or acquiring knowledge, which seems to be the most passive and sort of independent um, learning activity, requires is fundamentally based on some kind of social interaction because even if the learner is just reading an article in a journal they're intera interacting on some level intellectually with the author of that article so i think all these models really um, drive home how important the social aspect of learning um, online is however um in my experience of working with many academics and being involved in a lot of online teaching and learning, I've found that um, many students, even when we do follow good practice in um, learning design, and we create fantastic discussion forums for students, and we invite them to Zoom discussions and debates and so on, we find that many learners or many students are reluctant to engage socially. So I'm going to give you a few moments again just to um, note down some possible reasons why online learners don't always engage socially when we give them those opportunities. Okay, some really great comments coming up here. And if you look at these through the lens of those four types of engagement, um, I'm seeing a lot of emotional engagement coming up here, afraid of making a mistake, self-consciousness, shyness, uh, fear of being seen as less knowing than others, um, lack of trust in own competence or knowledge, lack of confidence, uh, and then we've got social engagement as a potential barrier as well. We've got culture with a question mark, uh, which, yeah, is a very uh, a very deep question there. Uh, social anxiety, people feeling isolated. Um, we're seeing, and then we're seeing behavioral engagement, student availability due to life demands, and that really is a massive thing for students learning online back to more emotional things, feeling exposed. Language problems would come under cognitive engagement because it's a, it's a huge barrier to um, cognitive engagement. And it, again, is a big issue online because many of our learners are globally based and therefore not speaking the local language that the course is um, delivered through. Okay, so really great, <laughs> fantastic responses coming up here. Um, not brave, that's a really interesting one in terms of our different kinds of spaces. Um, lack of trust in the power of online social engagement. Previous ex experiences, trauma, conditioning, social norms, learned behaviors psychosocial difficulties impacting their sense of confidence, social engagement, fear of making mistakes, shame, etc. So um, we could certainly spend a lot longer on this. What I'm going to do is show you how your answers really fit right into the model that um, emerged through my PhD research. I'm not going to take you through the whole model because that's a, a different topic for a longer session. but. Um, You'll see in this model, the outer ring has the four dimensions of online engagement. So there's behavioral, cognitive, social and collaborative and emotional engagement. And what I found um, through my qualitative research with um, 10 refugees and asylum seekers who I interviewed um, at different stages in their online learning journey was that each of those 
um, engagement dimensions is underpinned by a specific capability. And those capabilities come from work done by Martha Nussbaum, Amartya Sen and Melanie Walker. Um, and I've written quite a lot about this elsewhere. I'm happy to talk about it, but I'm going to kind of fast forward a little bit because the focus here is going to be on um, social and collaborative engagement and the capability for affiliation and recognition, which underpins it, coupled with emotional engagement and the capability for emotional health. Now, just a comment about this model is that all the engagement dimensions are underpinned by specific capabilities and those specific capabilities are underpinned again by what I've called elementary capabilities, which are really about survival. They're about remaining, staying alive, remaining healthy, being um, living in a state of um, not too much uncertainty and so on. And then at the very core is student agency. So I'm not saying this is a deterministic model. Um, students can do incredible things, can overcome incredibly difficult challenges using their agency. Um, but all these things are constantly interrelated. So going on to an explanation of the concept of capabilities, because we tend to use the term capabilities in English to mean skills and abilities that can be learned or practiced, like this guy on their skateboard who's clearly clearly is very capable at uh, skateboarding. But um, in the capabilities approach, and this was um, Amartya Sen's uh, notion originally, Capabilities include freedoms that are socially or environmentally shaped. So this image here is of women in Saudi Arabia on bicycles. Um, clearly, they're all capable of riding a bicycle. They have that skill and ability. But do they actually have the capability to like, ride a bicycle to work if they wanted to? Well, one factor that might be against them doing that is that the temperature might be 40 degrees or above, and that might make it very difficult to cycle. But beyond that, within the legal structure of Saudi Arabia, I don't know if this has changed since this article was um, published in 2017, but women were only allowed to ride bicycles in certain um, places, parks and on beaches, and only if accompanied by a male guardian. So do they actually have the capability to fully ride a bicycle? The answer there is no. And this is the part that really, um, for me in my research, made the difference really kind of it had explanatory power as to why students were not engaging when it seemed like everything was in place to enable them to engage. So I'm just going to look at the underpinning capabilities for emotional engagement and then for social and collaborative engagement. So for emotional engagement, the underpinning capability is emotional health. This comes very much from Melanie Walker's work in 2006, where she, building on Martha Nussbaum's original list of capabilities for um, democratic participation in society, Melanie Walker um, found that emotional engagement was really significant for students um, in higher education. And that it's one thing to be able to experience emotions that contribute positively to your learning, but it's another thing to not be subject to anxiety or fear because those things diminish learning. And those things can be completely outside of the control of both the learner and the institution or the teacher. So, and I must uh, just mention a, a shout out here for the, the images I'm using, which are from Francis Bell's magnificent um, Femed Tech quilt. Um, thank you again to Francis and everybody who contributed uh, images to that. Uh, so then looking at social and collaborative engagement, um, this is underpinned by the capability for what I'm calling affiliation and recognition. Again, drawing on the same sources, and you'll probably be familiar with work by Nancy Fraser on um, recognitive justice. So it's this is all about social justice. 
So what we tend to focus on, and, and I've been guilty of this a lot when I run ABC workshops, for example, or Carpe Diem learning design workshops, is let's get students interacting with each other to learn new knowledge and solve problems. And we kind of, and we, we create what seem to be engaging discussion forum activities or um, student group um, problem solving activities. But the bit that is so much harder, I'm seeing you there, Chris Yell. <laughs> Thanks, um, I'm watching the time. The bit that is so much harder to design for is the, um, the stuff that is completely outside of our control. Well, uh, to a great extent, outside of people's control as well. And that is about being treated with dignity and entering into relationships of mutual respect, recognition and trust. So. For people, just going back to those diagrams that George showed earlier, in that wider society, the way people um, treat one um, can be completely um, outside of one's control. But when we're trying to create this um, accountable space, that's what I'm coming on to next. The question is, how do we really make it a space where people can be treated with dignity and feel comfortable to enter into relationships of mutual respect, recognition and trust. And this is so important because um, one of the most striking findings of my research was that every dimension of engagement fueled all the others. Not It didn't always fuel all of the others at the same time, but it would fuel at least one other kind of engagement. So what I've got here is just this diagram showing that emotional engagement fuels all the others, but equally social and collaborative engagement fuels cognitive engagement, fuels emotional and behavioral engagement. So if we can create spaces where people feel comfortable and free and safe to engage collaboratively and socially, then we're much more likely to keep students engaged cognitively, keep them in the course um, and, and in situations where there is a high dropout rate, potentially reduce that dropout. So the question really is um, about building accountable spaces. And this is a quote from Elise Ahenkora's blog post that George was, both of us um, are responding to in, in our talks. And she says, says, to move forward, we don't need to promise safety or expect bravery. We need to embrace accountability. Um, so I was going to ask you this question but I'm actually going to skip that. I'm really sorry because we're a bit shorter on time than I expected. So I'm gonna give you my thoughts and um, it would be great if people want to stay on a bit afterwards and, and give other suggestions. Um, so yeah, agreeing principles for working together is, um, is obviously a really central uh, theme here. So spending time at the start of a, um, of any new course, giving students time and actually prioritizing, talking about how we're going to display and demonstrate respect for one another, how we're going to agree or disagree constructively. Um, being trauma aware is another thing that I learned about in this research. And that is because um, there's a lot of literature now about trauma awareness and um, certainly when working with refugees and asylum seekers, it's things like not asking people direct questions about their um, previous experiences. It's about giving people space to step away if they need to step away and come back into the learning process. And it's about, again, creating spaces where students feel safe and comfortable and feel that others are accountable for their actions as well in engagement. It's about building and modeling relationships of mutual respect, recognition and trust with and between students. And that needs a bit of unpacking, but in a nutshell, if you're moderating a discussion forum, for example, then it's about taking the care to um, to demonstrate all those aspects of affiliation and recognition and to highlight them when other students do it and to intervene when other students um, don't do it in peer, in peer interactions. 
And finally, uh, the image here is a bit tongue in cheek because the point I want to make is the same that George made. It's about enshrining mutual respect, recognition and trust in institutional codes of conduct and policies. I'm sure there are loads of other ideas from the room, but um, I'll stop there. There are some references at the end and um, that's a QR code to, um, to these slides as well. Thanks, Chrissy. I'll stop there. Thank so you so, so much. To... That was really interesting uh, to hear a little bit more about um, your research, uh, but also your ideas moving forward. Uh, I particularly relate to what you say about emotional health to um, to to lead and, and foster a democratic, as you said, participation for all of us, how we need to be accountable. Uh, and again, uh, the, the issue came up with we may have the structures in place, but it's still doesn't happen. So uh, your suggestions are really useful there. Um, also about modeling what you um, you know what we do, what we want uh, our students in your case in online settings to to be their lived uh, experience. But also perhaps it made me think about um, vulnerability and bell hooks and others talk about pedagogy of vulnerability and being part uh, of that community and and it links to modeling as well. Um, we are almost at the end, but I would, uh, I hope that uh, you will be able to stay a little bit longer so that we can engage with George uh, and Gabi in a, in a brief conversations about uh, these important issues and ideas uh, and experiences they shared with us. Um, we had a question here. I'm going to pick that up. Uh, it, it came from it was more an observation from Samantha, who has unfortunately had to go, but I think it's worth um, looking at this as well. Gabi, it relates to what you said about online learning, and Samantha tells us about her experience of being an online uh, student on a master's course, and that she only engaged about 10%, if I remember that comment correctly. Uh, and she rationalized this as um, something that happened because of the pressures and the volume of work that was required and didn't see that there was space for her to engage uh, in, in a social way, in a more collaborative way. And I think for me, this is something about uh, how we design our curriculum. Uh, is it too cramped? Do we, do we have that space and freedom? So I'll hand over to you, Gabby, maybe for this question. Thank you. Okay, I'll give a very short answer to that, and that is yes. <laughs> I think um, it's a it's a real tendency of um, academics to want to get as much content in as possible, and I think it's a good thing about the learning design workshops that we do usually run, following those principles of the ABC or Carpe Diem and so on. Um, that we get people to step away from the content and say, well, what are your students actually going to do? What learning activity are they going to do? How are they going to work with this stuff, make sense of it? And I really think we just need to keep doing that and, and not forget the importance of giving people space to learn and breathe. Thank you so much. Um, maybe can we go to the question um, raised earlier to, to George about how art can potentially help us create accountable spaces. Thank you, George. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, well, the, the the thing is, in being engaged in art, um, we take off the, we take the pressure to perform off the the people that are working with us. We create a space where um, you know people are engaged in a mixture of playing and deep focus simultaneously. It's quite unique in that respect. Um, so art really, all sorts of art, exists at the intersection of play and deep self-reflection. This is where this is where the magic happens. Uh, and also it's something that students, particularly vulnerable students, um, uh, in psychiatric settings where we had a, a presence in the psychiatric unit, they could go in as deeply or as um, at the shallow end, if you like, of emotional experience. And it offered a continuum of expression that I think is very difficult to do in any other way. In terms of socialization, you immediately create a setting where there is a shared uh, common interest, a purpose. So art is really perfectly placed to create those environments, those environments where we can 
engage people, create accountability, but also give people the opportunity to step back. Because as Gabby said, you know, that has to be there at all times. Taking the pressure to perform, to be brilliant at something is the key that makes art work, particularly in therapeutic environments. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. And this uh, confirms uh, my personal thoughts I have to say about men, often people think, oh, I'm I'm not creative. I can't draw. I can't do anything. But it's yes. not about, uh, you know, the aesthetic value, if you like, of the output of that artwork that we are creating, but the symbols, uh, the metaphors, the stories that are uh, part of this and I can see that in your work explicitly you know for me that's what attracted me <laughs> to come closer to you and, and find you uh, and it is about if you like going from something like this you know that is messy to this ah yes yeah <laughs> okay let's move to another uh, final question perhaps or, or I, I will check but there was one question from Salha uh, about the importance of open education, uh, especially for refugees, asylum seekers, and those in need and uh, marginalized groups, perhaps also more generally. So um, Salha asked the question perhaps for, for Gabi about how we can alert people that, higher, uh, that open education is here um, and that it plays a key role uh, in, in learning, in creating knowledge, in disseminating knowledge, in, in bringing people together and creating these valuable relationships? Gabi. Mm. Um, I think the answer to this is different from what I focused on in my research, because my research was really looking at mainstream distance learning and the refugees who participated in, in that study were learners on a course that was open to everybody, basically. They had sanctuary scholarships for it. So for open education, um, I think the key is in creating partnerships with people. And an example of that is the work I'm doing currently with UCL, where um, our unit has um, relationships with teaching, with organizations both in Lebanon and in Thailand. And we're kind of um, facilitating a South-South exchange of knowledge at the moment about that. So um, just to give you an example, two weeks ago, we ran a workshop in Mesut in Thailand, which is on the border with Myanmar, where there are many, many refugees um, from Myanmar. And there are refugee camps and there are migrant learning centers and there are NGOs. And there's quite um, quite a lot of informal activity happening there that's funded by big funders like Save the Children and so on. And um, and working together with those bodies, um, the the group that I'm involved in at UCL has already produced um, a MOOC on Future Learn. They refer to it as a co-MOOC because it was co-designed, collaboratively designed, and designed with a context in mind. Um, that was the context of refugee camps in Lebanon a couple of years ago. And now we're working in partnership with people in Thailand to, and, and some of those people don't have electricity or any infrastructure to access MOOCs, but there'll be one person in a teaching role who will be able to get access to stuff electronically and then bring it back and share it through printed means and so on. So I think partnerships are the key and there's a lot in the literature about that beyond just the examples I've given. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this, this shows actually the value of open education. While we talk about open education, something that happens in the in the digital world, actually mm. there's a lot of value and need to make resources, to make practices available offline. So what you uh, showed there is sort of a potentially social learning uh, in an offline uh, local environment that is happening despite the difficulties and the barriers mm. that are mm. in place for digital uh, and online um live engagement with, with others. Thank you so much, Gabi, for that. Um, I think we have reached the end uh, of, uh, of our session here today. There's a lot of appreciation for both of your contributions, thought provoking. I think uh, you made us think in, in different ways and uh, help us see that responsibility that we all have and act so that we can all together create these spaces 
that are nurturing, um, that helps us grow um, and uh, and develop together as individuals, but also collectively. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, um, this, uh, as I said, this is the end of our session today. There are more uh, sessions the Knowledge Equity Network is organizing. Uh, so please visit our website to have a look, but also consider signing, reading, first of all, uh, and signing um, the declaration of the Knowledge Equity Network, which is available uh, through the QR code, but also the website, um, which can be easily accessed. Thank you very much again to Gabby uh, and George for sharing their valuable insights with us all. Uh, thank you everybody for, for joining us today and we hope to see you again very soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.